episode of the NLN podcast, Nursing Edge Unscripted, The Surface Track, and thank you for joining us. This episode is entitled, Introducing the Year of the Nurse Educator Series, Boots in the Trenches, Our Sights on the Future, where we discuss today the experience of managing the moment-to-moment -moment demands of being a healthcare clinician and leader in today's landscape painted by COVID, while aiming to keep moving forward and plan for the future. And to help us today is Jaslyn Moreno, faculty lead for the Maryland Clinical Simulation Resource Consortium, or MCSRC, at Montgomery College. And Jaslyn Moreno is also an associate faculty. Jaslyn has been a leader in simulation since 2015 and specializes in faculty development for simulation educators. She also serves as a member on the board for the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning, or NAXL. And she sits on another board, which is very special to us here at the podcast. She sits on the NLN Nursing Edge Editorial Advisory Board. The board members are nurse educators and leaders that solicit, review, and approve blog pitches for the NLN Nursing Edge blog. Jaslyn, thank you for joining us. Hi, Michelle. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to be here. So, you know, Jaslyn, you and I have had multiple conversations and um, especially around planning for this year of the nurse educator. So I want to first start by just describing a little bit about what this campaign is. And then I want to dive into some questions um, with you to sort of share with our, our listeners and our viewers um, about what we have in store for everybody. So I'm gonna start with just describing the Year of the Nurse Educator. It's a campaign um, by the NLN for the year of 2022. So we're gonna celebrate all year long. And it's really intended to highlight these stories of educators who challenged traditional customs and implemented change. Uh, but more importantly than that, it was during a time of wild uncertainty. Um, and we don't even really probably need to name the thing, right? We've been talking about it uh, being the pandemic for quite some time. Uh, but all this change and innovation during a time of uncertainty and even sometimes fear. And you know, the initiative uh, also aims to share these stories uh, that inspire more innovation and uh, more initiatives to really keep us moving forward, not just reacting or responding, but really moving forward. And so, um, and, and we, I think we really want to dive into a little bit more about this academic practice space, where a lot of these initiatives and innovations happened in during the pandemic, um, and during this time of uncertainty, but, and again, will continue, I think, hopefully to happen as we move forward, um, getting our learners, uh, you know, back into the clinical space, learning hands-on, um, really being creative about what does that look like, helping our partners meet um, staffing needs and orienting and onboarding our new nurses as they leave the academic um, area. So, you know, what I wanted to talk about with you, Jaslyn, as, as you are a valued uh, member of our editorial board for this podcast, um, you were sharing within that board some really fantastic ideas about conversations that Rachel and I can have in the upcoming year with, with guests um, around celebrating the year of the nurse educator. And so Rachel and I really wanted to collaborate with you to develop this series. And we would love to kick off hearing some of your ideas about the series. So I want to start, the very first question I have is, what does celebrating the Year of the Nurse Educator mean to you? Thank you, Michelle, um, for asking me that, because it's something that I've been pondering for quite some time. And really celebrating the Year of the Nurse Educator, to me, means empowerment. This is truly our year the year for nurse educators. Um, we, like you said, we have been through so much over the past two years that we, we just can't move into the future the same. We really have to um, apply what we've learned and how much we've grown into our future practice. 
So I often talk to my colleagues about this idea I have that there's going to be a pre and um, post pandemic era in nursing academia. Things are going to be different. Um, there's just been so much growth in the area of nurse education that we cannot leave it behind. Um, I can give you one example. This is something that's very close to my heart. Um, the pandemic forced us to reimagine clinicals. You know, many of us were not able to go to our hospital partners settings. And we really had to see how we could prepare our future nurses without that. And this process highlighted some of the shortcomings of traditional clinical. We realized that there were some gaps. Now, many leaders have um, discussed this, have published, researched um, on this topic for quite some years now. But this conversation has truly become mainstream. Um, I don't think this was a topic that we could, we would feel comfortable talking about with a group of nurse educators before. But now with the pandemic and what we've lived through, we've kind of created spaces for these types of conversations to occur organically. Um, we're making real changes to how nurses are prepared to enter a profession. At Montgomery College, we have defined clinicals to be a combination of traditional clinicals, live and virtual simulations. This is real progress for us. I think many other nursing programs and schools in the area in, all throughout the nation are also assessing their curriculums and really seeing you know, what, what does it look like in the future? What changes need to be made? So I think it's very appropriate that NLN has chosen 2022 to be the year of the nurse educator because this year is pivotal for nursing academia. Nurses must lean in and make their voices heard so that we collectively can create a new pathway for our new generation of nurses. I think it's important that we are intentional so that we can ensure that we are preparing nurses of the future. A nurse who can provide evidence-based care, care to all individuals of all ethnicities, and you know, to sum it up, as you can tell, I'm very excited to be here um, living through this experience. Um, I think we're on the brink of something great and I'm just excited to see where the future is going for nursing academia. That's wonderful, Jasmine. And you know, there are a few things that you said that I want to underscore, which is where I love that you said, we're going to be doing things differently, right? And we've, we've got to um, create new ways of, of doing old business. And old business, meaning clinical, as one example that you gave, where it used to be one hospital or one school would do the kind of cool, creative, weird, maybe uh, clinical solution of having, you know, pairing up uh, teachers and nurses and, and students in, in different ratios, for example. Or, or spreading them out differently over the course of a week instead of a traditional eight hour day. Um, that used to be the one-off. It used to be the, oh, we're trying something new. Um, but it wasn't, and it may have been, to be fair, it may have been in response to some challenge somewhere. But now I think what you're saying or what I'm hearing you say is that this is widespread. This is going to be across the board, not just in a school here, a hospital here, a community setting here. This is all, all the way, you know, we're all going to be feeling this and responding to um, doing things differently and in a new way. And I, I, I'm with you, I, this lights me up. I get excited about this. So the other thing I heard you say was one of my favorite words, which is curriculum. And you said, you know, this, we're going to be having to really rework our curricula to, re to integrate thoughtfully, right? I'm thinking these solutions. This isn't just a, let's just put vSIM here or yeah. virtual, or not vSIM specifically, but virtual simulation um, as standardized participant simulation here. Uh, you know, we're not just putting up, um, you know, kind of damming up the holes anymore. We did have to do that for a minute. We had to do that. And okay. we had our hands and our thumbs and all the holes. And we did a great job, but I think we need to now talk about integration. You're absolutely correct. I think, you know, we, we've been creative and it's always um, kind of solving the problem. And now we realize these solutions are really, you know, things that need to be integrated into our curriculum. So instead of using them as just a band-aid, 
you know, let, let's see how we can truly maximize because we're, we're, we learned over the past two years that students engage in this manner. You know, they're learning. This is really how we can foster clinical judgment. You know, that's, that's what we're all trying to do, right? Um, with the next gen coming up. So we're learning these, these things work. So let's be intentional, you know, let's be mindful. And, um, you know, like I said, they have been experts. NLN put out their vision series in 2015. So this isn't new. <laughs> I think it's just more mainstream now. Now we're really seeing it happen. And that's why I'm so excited. Great. Um, you know, I want to also transition us to uh, another question that, that um, we had. Uh, you know, in our brainstorming conversations, you and I, um, we emphasize, I think collectively, the need to acknowledge the challenges that nurse educators and clinical partners are face, facing uh, regarding managing the immediate priority, what is right in front of us, and at the same time, looking ahead to prepare for the next thing, right? Having your foot straddling two very challenging spaces, I would say. And I think that this is especially important when we talk about advancing some really critical in, in my view, priorities, such as equity and access um, to education, to healthcare. Um, so I'm wondering if you can share your thoughts on you know, why this emphasis was important to you. I know we talked about it together, but I really wanna hear your, your uh, perspective. Sure. So again, I think the pandemic highlighted the inequity that exists in today's healthcare. It's prevalent, it's everywhere. Um, you know, I don't know if we just weren't aware of it before the pandemic, and now it's kind of in our face. We just cannot ignore it anymore. Um, we must take time to truly understand the systemic problem before we can address it. Um, I think there's still, it's difficult conversations that need to be had. And it's, it's tough, you know, not everyone wants to talk about uh, these issues. Um, but one way we can start is by educating or providing our future nurses with tools so they can be part of this change and help foster the change that we're seeking. Um, one thing that I share with my colleagues is to start discussing implicit bias, something very small, but bringing it to their attention and really doing a self-reflection on what their personal biases might be. You know, um, I think years ago, I, I don't consider myself that young anymore, but you know, I didn't think I had any biases. You know, I, I saw things black and white and I was right. Um, but with experience, I realized, no, I, I definitely, you know, having um, a cultural, very rich cultural background had some biases and still continue to. But just bringing that awareness into our conscious thoughts, you know, and being um, mindful of that as we make decisions, as we go throughout our daily lives, I think is huge. Um, manifesting that dignity belongs to everybody. You know, just truly believing that and understanding what that means um, and just conveying that to our future nurses. I think that's one small change that we can start, you know, instilling in the folks that are around us and the folks that we come across is huge um, because it's a huge systemic problem. And I ponder this all the time and it's, you know, and as an idealistic, you know, I wish you could change the world, but you can't, right? So what types of change can you foster? And to me, it's just bringing that bias to the forefront, you know, and starting with, with just one student at a time, I think will change the nursing workforce. And then, there, you know, will be examples for other health professions um, in, in healthcare today. You know, um, I keep thinking about my colleague and partner uh, in this podcast um, is, is Rachel, and I know she's not physically or audibly here right now. Um, she wasn't able to make this episode, uh, but I want to just bring her in here because um, I know her and I have had many conversations about this, and we talk about just taking that one step forward, that low-hanging fruit, right? And that low-hanging fruit is a big deal. And I'm going to get a little corny here with an analogy, but the fruit also has seeds in it, right? So if you just do one step, one thing in one class, um, in, in one program, with one, with, even with one student, just have that one conversation with one student, how that can um, really 
have a, a domino effect in a good way, right? Everybody that 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 student te like uh, touches now, and that when they go into clinical, and now they have a different mindset um, because of a conversation maybe you had, or because of a reframe, a little debriefing that you had. You know that it trickles down, and it really does reach people. I think in a really meaningful way. So I like what you're saying about this kind of just do this one thing, not the 47 not the, you know, 1 million things that we all want to do um, to really, I think, make a change, but the one thing. Yeah, I like concrete, you know? <laughs> yeah. So this is something that I feel like I can, it's tangible. I can do it in my daily life, you know? And I feel like I'm making a change. So, you know what, um, Jaslyn, there's, what I'd like to do is give our viewers and listeners um, a little sneak peek into some of the topics that we really want to cover. Um, this, I would, I say this year because the Year of the Nurse Educator um, podcast series is going to be a little mini series inside of our our year um, season, I suppose, that spans the entire calendar year. So we're hoping to have four, five, six different conversations that are really focusing on this academic practice partnership that's really focusing on celebrating the year of the nurse educator with many different stakeholders. So um, Jaslyn, if you could share some of the ideas that you have around topics that we could cover and, and Rachel and I will take this information and we will run with it, uh, really yeah, put it into action, I hope. Yeah, I think we've, um, you know, we, we've given a lot of thought to this series because it is so important. And um, some topics that I think that would be interesting to really discuss and uncover would be maybe, you know, having conversations with um, partnerships between schools and hospital settings and have leaderships comment on, you know, where they think they, their programs are going and what do the hospital partnerships want to see. Um, discuss the intersection of nursing education and practice demands in the transition of now and tomorrow, right? Um, celebrate mentorship. I think, you know, mentorship is so powerful. And if we can just take a moment to celebrate this process, uh, leadership and partnership between nurse educators and nurse leaders that inspire innovation to transform challenges into practical solutions that advance care for patients. Um, there's so many things, you know, looking at talking to our clinical partners, our clinical instructors who are, you know, spending an insane amount of time sometimes, you know, with close relationships and, you know, seeing what they are really seeing in our learning, in our learners and having them be part of the conversation as we assess our curriculums and as we move forward and make changes in our curriculum. Um, yeah, so this uh, series is very exciting. I think we're going to hear from people that we normally don't hear from on these podcasts, and we really get to um, really see what, what they're thinking about the future of nursing academia, of nursing practice in general, and really get a view of where we might be heading. And, you know, I think I'm very excited to uh, hear some of the guests that we have um, scheduled, and I, I look forward to it. Great, Jaslyn, and I am too, um, especially around a, a lot of conversation. Like, I think what you're saying is we're going to have some guests that we haven't had on before, some different roles, um, especially in the clinical practice role. I'm really looking forward to that because we have such a critical and important partnership as a nurse educator with our clinical partners because our programs have um, outcomes that... It, of course, set by accreditation and our programs create these outcomes where we're trying to get our learners to this point, but that's really not the end point, right? The end point is actually a step beyond that and then a step beyond that, right? So when we hand off our learners to our clinical partners, um, then our learners enter a new phase, which is usually orientation, and then they almost have new program outcomes. And then they move into their, if we think about, you know, Benner's novice to expert, then they go into their um, proficient kind of area and our, their competent area. Um, and then eventually their expertise, you know, their expert um, uh, level. So, you know, our learners will continue to have 
their own professional development and their own set of outcomes as they move on beyond us. And I think for us as nurse educators to have a connection with uh, where our learners are going beyond us, I think can be very helpful and inform maybe a little bit more about the development we can provide our learners to be better prepared. Um, and we can't do that without these conversations. We can't do that without um, just coming together to hear of, of our successes and I think our, our challenges. The other thing I hope to have weaved in here is not only where we hand off our learners um, into practice, but maybe where they're coming from. Uh, and we talk a lot about generationally too, that um, when we think about the generations coming into nursing school, I know I'm raising some Gen Zs at home and they are different. They are different people. I'm telling you, we're going to have to, it's not about the millennials anymore. Um, I consider myself a, a, an, a, an exennial, maybe a little bit of a hybrid. I've got a little millennial in me somewhere. Um, but the, you know, our Gen Zs and our, our new learners coming in, they are learning differently. They're being evaluated differently. So they're engaging differently personally and academically. So I really think we need to also have some conversations around that too. And I, I think we can, between talking about mentorship and partnerships um, and, and really inviting the different kinds of guests that have such a, a, a diverse, um, have many diverse perspectives, I think we, we can bring up a lot of these um, conversations and topics that I think will really resonate, I hope, with nurse educators um, everywhere. I'm, I'm confident that it will. You know, I think this is something <laughs> that we've been waiting for just to, you know, have these types of conversations. I love the idea of, um, you know, speaking to our, our, our learners, you know, where they're coming from, you know, that, that's very cool. <laughs> I think it'd be great. Um, so uh, now Jaslyn is the most fun part of our conversation is the fun part, uh -huh. which is uh, rapid fire questions. So um, are you ready for that? I think I'm ready. All right, awesome. So if you were to write a memoir, what would you title the book? Um, so I think it would either be eternally grateful because I think I have been blessed, um, especially in my career. I have, I can say confidently that I have enjoyed every phase of my nursing career or my nursing journey. Um, from my first fundamental class that I took at University of Maryland um, till now, there was probably one job that I did that I didn't enjoy and I found out very early on and you know, it was three months and I left. But other than that, I have truly been blessed and just truly am grateful for, I, having lived through what we lived through, I think that sense of um, being grateful is just what gets you through. You know, it, it really, looking at that silver lining makes you feel like you're, you know, you're able to get through the next day. <laughs> so um, it, it would be eternally grateful or a fine balance. You know, I have young kids at home. Um, I have a career that I love and just kind of juggling and balancing that um, is, is the struggle. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, a lot of us can, um, uh, can share. And, you know, I think I'm most happy when I have that balance, when I can kind of have my cake and eat it too, right? <laughs> I do love some cake. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's wonderful. And I think what you're saying, you know, I agree is gratitude really can put us in a frame of mind where we can really, I think, tackle most things, you know? I think we can meet adversity or challenges um, in a much more gracefully if we're, if we have this real sense of, sincere sense of gratitude. You're absolutely right. So the next question is, what is on the top of your reading list right now for fun? Yep, so um, my brain is always scattered, so I tend to read more than one books, you know? Um, so I'm reading something called The God of Small Things, it's um, an older book written by an Indian author. Um, the story takes place in Kerala, in India, South India. And it just kind of follows the journey of a family. And, you know, it's just kind of something that I like to read. It kind of, you know, 
travels back there, even though I can't go, but you know, the description of the area is beautiful and kind of enjoy that. And then I'm also reading um, something called Biased, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice. You might be familiar with this one that shapes what we see, think, and do. And this is a little bit more serious, but I enjoy it because it kind of keeps me fresh, <laughs> you know, um, and it really uncovers the, the thought process that we engage in on a daily basis, you know, and how we ourselves sometimes don't realize our brain is doing this, you know. Um, I, you know, I say I have young kids, so I go to the park all the time and I realize, wait a minute, I'm kind of, you know, making judgments about these kids, you know, without even, <laughs> you know, so it's something that we do all the time and it really takes, um, awareness to catch yourself and make sure that we don't make these bad decisions or bad judgments. So I'm enjoying that. So those are my top books right now. Fantastic. Um, what is, what is your favorite quote? So my favorite quote is, we must be the change that we want to see in the world. And it's by Mahatma Gandhi. And it's just, it kind of states, you know, kind of everything that I believe, because we can't control. I mean, I, I have, you know, maybe some influence over my kids at this point, but beyond that, you know, I can't control anything, um, but I can control my actions. And, you know, kind of seeing what's happening in the world, it can be very um, discouraging and disappointing, but knowing that I have control over my actions and I can make that, you know, make that be the impact that I want in the world. So I, I love that quote. You know, I think I have magnets of it around my house. And <laughs> Gosh, Shazlin, you know, you bring me back to, uh, I was probably in my mid twenties when I had this like coming of age, massive, you know, realization, this aha moment, right. An epiphany of I can't change anything. <laughs> and I was like, huh, <laughs> boy, that would have been helpful to know. Um, and so I, I do appreciate that that lesson has stuck with me and has served me very well, just understanding you know, what, what uh, we can do for ourselves, our perspectives, our the way we respond to the world around us um, can really make such a big difference. And so I, I find your quote inspirational as well. Um, if you could have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? So I think right now it would be really cool to sit with Florence Nightingale and just get her thoughts on what's happening. You know, I, I spoke earlier about being at the brink of change for nursing academia and nursing practice. You know, where what does she think about that? I think she um, must have had so much opposition to change in her lifetime. And the fact that she was able to accomplish as much as she did, you know, I, I'd ask her about simulation. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. Can we get by it? <laughs> um, so just, I think it'd be really cool because it would be full circle. You know, we're talking about this new wave and this new uh, curriculum change. And, you know, I think things that are gonna stay with us for the next 50 years, maybe, right? Um, but just, always looking back to the past and learning lessons, you know, so I would love to hear from her and um, just ask her for advice, you know, I think it'd be really cool. I, I think the conversation would, uh, would last for a long time. <laughs> I think so too. Now that you've got me going, I've, I'm like going to start writing down all my questions. <laughs> Whoa. I'm going to be like, you know, I, I have a lot too. I'm starting to wonder, you know, um, well, thank you. Thank you, Jaslyn, so much um, for your wisdom, your, your contributions to the podcast, and more, more specifically to the Year of the Nurse Educator, how our little podcast is going to celebrate um, this much bigger initiative, this much bigger, um, really, celebration. So I, I appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. And um, Thank you so much, Michelle. It has been my pleasure. I have truly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for joining us on this episode of NLN Nursing Edge Unscripted Surface. We hope you join us next time. Until then, remember, whether your water is calm or choppy, stay connected, get vulnerable, and dare to go beneath the surface.